Good evening and welcome to this meeting of Breck Road Baptist Church. We're thankful that you're here and we look forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening. I hope you've come with a heart and mind ready to hear from the Lord. And uh, despite all the weather, God has brought you here. And don't mind if the roof is leaking. It'll be okay. The Lord will help us. So let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon the meeting. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before Thee and thank Thee again that we can gather together. We praise Thee, Father, that we still live in a country where we can legally meet, where we can worship Thee freely according to our conscience and according to Thy Word. We pray, Father, that Thou will help us never to take that for granted. May we redeem the time that we've been given and use this time to bring great glory and honor to Thee. We pray, O Lord, tonight that Thou will keep back Satan from every hindrance from Thy Word that he would love to throw our way. We pray, Lord, give our minds real liberty to hear thy word tonight. And, Lord, to understand. And, Father, we pray to believe thee. There are some here tonight that do not know thee. They're still lost in their sin. And yet, without Christ, we pray tonight they would call upon thee and know thee while there's time. We pray for the believer here this evening. And we ask, O Lord, that thy word would challenge, convict, edify. Help us, Lord, to be brought nearer to thee. O Lord, we pray that we would... Become the believer, the Christian that thou hast saved us to be. Please, Lord, we pray, may we may have had a week of losing, a week of failing thee. But, Father, we pray, may victory begin here tonight. We ask, O oh Lord, as we pray often for revival, we pray that we begin in our heart. That, Lord, we would have a renewed love and zeal for thee. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou would make a, great, uh, make a great impact in the meeting tonight. In the hearts and minds of those who are here and those who are watching via live stream. Oh Lord, we pray that all that's said and done here would be great, bring great glory and honor to Thee. We thank Thee for Thy grace and goodness. Please meet with us here this evening. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. If you take your hymn book, we'll stand and sing our first hymn. Hymn number 351. Hymn number 351. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. Look to the Lamb of God. Let's stand and sing hymn number 351.
seated. And tonight I'd invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the New Testament book of Revelation. The New Testament book of Revelation, and we'll look there this evening at Revelation chapter number 1, beginning there in verse number 1, and we'll read all the way down through the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1, and we'll read all the way down through the end of the chapter. And the Word of God says, beginning in Revelation chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him, to show unto His servants things which must shortly come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant John, who bear record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that He saw. Blessed is He that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and thus the first begotten from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the Beginning. I'm sorry, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and compassion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about with, the paps of a, with paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool and white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like the fine brass. If they, if they burned in a feet like fine brass, if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden seven candlesticks. The seven stars are the angel of angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And we'll stop our reading just there in verse number 20. And let's trust the Lord to add his blessing to the reading of his word. And so hold your place there. We will come back to that portion of scripture here in just a moment. Forgive me for my hoarse voice. I apologize. I've, I'm, not, I'm not ill, but for whatever reason, my, my, uh, my speech has just gone from me. So forgive me for that. And I hope I'm not too much of a bother to you. But I'm glad you're here this evening. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 446. Precious promise God hath given to the weary passerby. On the way from earth to heaven, I will guide thee with mine eye. Let's stand and sing hymn number 446. <coughs> Precious promise 
promise God hath given to the weary passerby on the way from earth to heaven I will guide thee with mine eye I will guide thee I will guide thee I will guide thee with mine eye on the way from earth to heaven I will guide I invite you to take your notice sheet if you have one, and uh, we'll go over a few things that are going on in the life and ministry of our church, some things to praise the Lord for, and good things that are happening. I want to say at the get-go, it's good to have many visitors here tonight, and uh, we have some, uh, someone said we have a few from Oxford here, and of course we have Philip here, Philip and Jenny are, God willing, going to be married in September, and uh, it's good to have them here with us this evening, and uh, we have Seth here with us, we don't get to see Seth very often. Um, but Seth has come. He's brought uh, a young man from Oxford, Paul Rishong, and we're glad to have them here. And uh, they, I think they were ministering. Seth was ministering in Carlisle and uh, stopped by on the way in. And so we're grateful to have him here. Could get a chance to know him. Seth is married to Joanna, and um, him and Joanna have two, uh, two children, Izzy and Adele. And so do take time to, not Izzy, his name's not Izzy. We call him Isri Izzy for short, but his name is Israel. And uh, so if you'll take time to get to know him and pray for Seth, and it's a real joy to have him here with us. And also, it's good to have Nick with us. And uh, Nick is going to share his testimony a little bit later. But I mentioned that Nick is, was a former student of Crown Hall several years ago. And his one summer, he worked at Camp Victory four years ago. He came and he got to spend two weeks in Liverpool. And the Lord used him. He was a tent leader to some of our children. And uh, he was a real blessing to us. And he's come back. His last week, is at, um, he's got one more week of camp. And then he's going back. Uh, his last time here at church is with us here in Liverpool, and so it's a real blessing to have him. Be sure to uh, get to take time to talk to Nick and uh, be an encouragement to him. So those are great things. It's wonderful to have people visiting with us. I want to say also that yesterday was a, a church work day. Many of you know the ministry hall next door. Uh, we are working on it constantly, and um, there is a lot of things being done. Well, uh, we've been working primarily on what was the flat. Um, you have to forgive me again for my voice. It's just part of it. But the flat upstairs is what we've been working on. And the ministry hall, which used to be the pub, we're converting into a Sunday school uh, room. And we're using it even today. There were Sunday school classes going on. One was taking place literally right where the bar used to be. Uh, but yesterday we needed to rip up the carpet and we needed to take out some of the tiles and we needed to cut off all the bars off the window. And so much work was done. We were cutting down not only that, those things, but cutting down trees, well, limbs of trees. We were cutting down fence posts. And uh, it was a great blessing to have so much help. And it's amazing how many hands make light work. And I just want to say thank you. If you were able to come, to come out and help us. That was a real help and a blessing. Let's continue to pray for that. We're trying to get it ready. 
uh, for September. There's a wedding happening on that day, and they'd like to use that for reception. But also, we're trying to get it ready so that we can use it um, for our mums and tots, for our English classes, for different things that go on throughout the week, our youth rallies. Um, it'd just be a great blessing to be able to use that building more regularly. And so please pray with us and come out to help. We'll be making some real pushing efforts to try to get things done, and we definitely need all the help we can, we can get. Um, if there was ever a time uh, for a living illustration or a reason why we needed a new roof, today was a good day for it. Um, as you can tell, there was water coming through every area, and if we hadn't been here, our sound decks would have once again been, been destroyed. And um, our roof is just, it's been here, it hasn't been replaced since the 1960s when it was first put on, and it is in dire need of um, a new roof. The felt underneath it has gone, and we've been praying about it, and the Lord has provided in a miraculous way for us to put on a new roof onto the, the building. And so in, in what was, seems like an impossible task, God met us where we are, and God willing, next week, please pray with me that the roofers will come and put on a new roof. They're meant to do that. Mr. David's going to be helping them supervise the project, so please pray that the Lord would, uh, would bless the work as they're, they're laboring on our roof. Some other things to keep in mind and to pray about. Camp Victory's around the corner. We have people leaving tonight, literally, to go down there and begin. And so please pray for our workers who are traveling down. If you want to know who they are, you can pray for them, specifically some of our workers. Uh, Rosie, Nick will be going down. You can pray for John, Seth, they'll be going down as well, and little Paul. Um, but also pray for some of ours, Zoe and Santiana. They're going to be wit workers, workers in training. They'll be going down tomorrow. And then also pray for some of our bus drivers who will be taking down young people. Carl and um, also Christine are going to be taking down young people tomorrow down to um, Camp Victory. So please do pray for them. Pray for Sylvia. She's going to be going down as well, her first time, taking her two children to work for two weeks. And so pray that the Lord would bless the time there. So we're asking that God blesses our young people. We're taking about 20 juniors, or give or take a few, that are coming down, and then also our seniors as well. And so let's pray for these two weeks of camp. Um, many things are decided that impact eternity in that one week at camp. I said before, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a camp. I was reached at a week of camp um, when I was heading in a completely different direction, and the Lord just stopped me dead in my tracks and pointed me to surrender my life to him, and that led to go off to a Christian college, which would give me an opportunity to come to England, and which would lead me to my wife, and eventually lead us here to be able to serve in Liverpool. All from one week, think of that. It's amazing. So please pray. Pray for those who are speaking. Pray for those who are working. There has been so much going on, and um, it's a very busy time, but it's wonderful to be busy in the Lord's work. So please keep those workers in your prayer and pray for that week of camp. Many of you have been so generous to help support our young people to go down, paying their entire way. We as a church try to pay for half, and many of you have volunteered to pay for several of them their whole, their whole way to go down. And that, that is a real blessing and a testimony to your, your faithfulness and your goodness. So thank you for that. Some other things to keep in mind, let's continue to pray for the work um, in Crowborough. I mentioned that this morning. Pray for the housers and pray for that work there. God willing, that church will be opening on August the 28th, and we'll be going down. And um, I've said it before, we have the longest drive to get down there. It's on a Sunday. It may not work for everybody to go down, but we can still pray for Carl and Charmaine. And the Lord used them here while Joy and I were away last year to be a real help, to continue things on while we were away. So really, please pray, and let's ask the Lord to, to help them. They're going to be taking up an offering for a minibus to help that church start. And it would be a good thing if, as a church family, if we prayed about a retiring offering that we could give towards them to help them with, with getting a minibus to begin that, that new work. And so let's pray about that. That will be in the month of August. Um, let's, it's good to have Laura in the meeting with us tonight. Continue to pray for the work at Norris Green. And we're asking God to help with the, the transitioning of things that are going on there to the trust. And ask the Lord to work with solicitors and pray for that work that... God would, would, would revive that work again and pray for Laura, and I know that she, she would be grateful for your prayers. Um, let's also continue to keep in mind some other things. You can see our missionary spotlight. She's probably very happy that we posted her photo there in the notice sheet, but please do pray for Rosie. We support her, and we want to continue to encourage her in the Lord's work. I said it this morning, but Rosie lives by faith. She only lives off of what um, churches support her at or what individuals support her at on a monthly basis. She had a very good career. She was a successful nurse and has sought to follow the Lord in this direction. So please do continue to encourage her and pray for her and ask the Lord to help her as she ministers up and down the country and here in Liverpool. 
So continue to pray for her as well. There are many other things that we're praying about and a lot of good things that are happening all around the world. And um, we've got a few people here with us tonight that you don't get to see very often. So he doesn't know that I'm going to ask him to come up. But I'd like to have Seth, if he wouldn't mind, to come along and share with us for a moment what God is doing in his life and through the work at Oxford. We've been praying for that work. They meet in a tent outside. They don't have a building big enough to hold the congregation. And uh, so if Seth could give us a little update about what God's doing in his life and at the work in Oxford. And then we'll have Nick just after. So come along, Seth. Well, good evening. It is a blessing to be here, and I'm very, very thankful for this church. And it's incredible what God is doing here through you guys. And I'm encouraged by it. I know that people across this country and across this world are. Um, and, and so I, I can speak as an outsider uh, how exciting it is to hear what God is doing. And I know it's a, a typical saying, but God is always advancing. And uh, where he advances, I want to be on the front line. Um, I know on the front lines in battle, it might get a little sticky. It might get a little messy. Um, there's probably some blood, sweat, and tears as uh, Churchill promised this nation years ago. But uh, the Lord's at work. And so I'm thankful that the people here, no doubt, who, who are sacrificing much and going after it uh, are a part of that work. And so um, in, my, in my own life and, and in the life of the ministry, many of you know, um, that I, I moved uh, to the United Kingdom as a missionary back in 2018 um, and, and labored, uh, have been laboring there in Oxford with Pastor Derek Moreland uh, for that time. Uh, amidst that, I met Joanna, who was uh, a student at Crown Hall, and uh, met her at camp like some other couples or a couple in this, this congregation um, meeting at camp. If, if any of you are working at camp this year and you're single, there might be hope for you. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, or if you're on the hunt, maybe come work camp next year. Um, I think it's too late to help this year. Uh, but anyway, so, so Joanna and I um, were, were met and were married. Uh, you might remember her probably as Joanna Chalefko, uh, but she's now Joanna Iser. Uh, we went to America. Hopefully, we thought we would be there for three months. And um, for some reason, COVID-19 hit our world. And so we were stuck in America for a year and three months. And um, while we were there, Israel was born. And then when we returned uh, shortly after we got here, Adele was born. And so um, I think the last time I was here, um, Joanna and I might have just been married. So, so in, the, in the time that, that you guys have grown, my family has grown. Um, and I just very, very much thank the Lord for that. In Oxford, as was mentioned, we, we were on the hunt for a building. Um, many of you know that uh, the, the building there in Jericho um, is very small, seats about 110 people if the children would sit on the floor. And um, during COVID-19, with those restrictions that were placed on churches, um, it was impossible for us to meet unless we would, would ask, you know, 50% of the congregation not to come. And so... Um, they, they, uh, Pastor Moreland, I was at the States at the time, but Pastor Moreland decided to set up a marquee and start meeting outside. Um, and so we met out there for a while. Then, then during winter retreat, when, as we returned from winter retreat, our marquee had been torn down by that, those hurricane force winds um, back in February. And then, uh, so then we started meeting in a barn for a while. And uh, after that, the turkeys <coughs> moved into the barn and we moved out of the barn. It started to smell uh, of, of poultry and uh, so it seemed like a good time to move out and so we moved back to the field um, but pray for us uh, not, not a lot of people know this but um, we're, we're, we're hoping and praying that the Lord would provide a building for us and we uh, ha have been in conversations with people about a property um, and so I don't, I don't know what will happen only the no Lord does and so we trust him and uh, I want to just share with you one, one quick verse. I know it's not a whole testimony, but here I go, you know. So, um, But this, this verse has really helped me a lot. In Psalm 29, verse 2, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And uh, nobody else deserves a glory. Not, not a single one of us. Um, not this church. Not our church. Um, it's the Lord's glory. And I'm thankful that the Lord is using people. Um, he's always used people. He's always accomplished his work through people. And he always, I, I think he will. He will continue in that way. Um, but he deserves the glory. And so I'm, I'm thankful to him 
that for some reason he's, he's chosen to allow me to be a part of his master plan. And so may he be glorified in it. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you, Seth. And I hope you'll take time to get to know Seth. He's a good friend, and the Lord's using him in Oxford. He's, he really is a great help to Pastor Moreland and the work there, able to help in so many different ways. And so please do pray for that, that church in Oxford. And I was a student when that church began, and the Lord's continued to use that church in a mighty way, and we're thankful for it. It's good to have Nick with us. And um, I, I, uh, Nick is from the same state that I'm from in America. And uh, we, neither of us have an accent from there, but uh, we're both from there. And uh, Nick is, uh, God's using him and, um, in many ways. And so I've asked Nick to come along and share with us a testimony, his testimony. Well, I'm thankful to be here. The last time I was in Liverpool was in 2018. And I've been trying to get back ever since then. And uh, as, as the pastor said, I grew up in the state of West Virginia in the United States. And I did not grow up in a Christian home. My family rarely went to church. And uh, from time to time, I went with my grandparents. But we, did, we didn't go to a Bible-believing church, uh, my family and I. And when I was five years old, I attended a holiday Bible club where uh, they said, each evening, if you would please come forward and, and would you say this prayer, you can go to heaven and you can get something out of the prize box. And so I thought, what an, what an exceptional deal. Not only do I get to go to heaven, but even better, I get to pull something out of the prize box. And so uh, being a reasonable five-year-old, I did just that. And I came forward and I, I said the, the prayer that they asked me to say. And I went to Holiday Bible Club that day as a sinner. And I left that day as a sinner. I wasn't trusting in Christ and in Christ alone for forgiveness of sins. So from that point forward, I assumed I'm a Christian because I have done this good thing. And I was confronted with the gospel from time to time, but I thought, I've, I don't need that. I've already done it. I'm, I'm good enough on my own. Well, it was when I was in what we call fifth grade. I was 11 years old. Uh, we had a knock at the door one morning. And there was an ambulance outside. And we thought, my mother ran to the door and she thought, you have the, they have the wrong house. There's no emergency here. So she told them they could leave politely. And they said, no, your house is on fire. And so we come running out of the house. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. Surely enough, there's flames coming out of the roof. And we had all just been inside eating and having breakfast and getting ready for school. And so we, we left the house. Um, we lost nearly the entire structure of the house, had to move out. And we were moving place to place. My father was a contractor, so he was working at rebuilding our home. And in that time, things started getting really rough in my parents' marriage. They began arguing loads. And I remember thinking, I was just 11 years old, thinking they are going to get a divorce. And I didn't want that. I was very fearful. And so I, uh, I did my best to try to encourage them not to get a divorce and, and to try to, to be a good boy and, and help them out. So one day they were arguing very fiercely in the living room right next to my bedroom. And I thought, I'll, I'll be a little cheeky, and I'll go and remind them um, that they have a family that, that they need to, to stay together for. So I went and gave my mother and my father a big hug and, a, uh, and told them how much I love them and returned to my bedroom. A few minutes later, I heard a gunshot. And my father had taken his own life. It was very difficult as a young person. Anytime a child loses a parent, it's very difficult. But there's a special pain that comes along when a parent chooses to leave a child. And I became very bitter. I became very upset. And it turned my eyes towards eternity and what faith is. And I remember having so much trouble within my spirit about really just not knowing what God was doing and why would he allow these things to happen. And a few months later, a friend invited me to go to a Bible camp, much like Camp Victory, and it was there for the first time that I truly heard the gospel preached. And I realized I was trusting in Nick Rizzi to get to heaven, to have a relationship with God. I was trusting in my being a good boy and going to church from time to time. And a prayer that I said when I was five years old, I wasn't trusting in the Lord Jesus and what he had done for me. That week I realized all of that. And I, I called out to Christ, asked him to forgive me of my sin, repented and turned away from my sin and turned toward him for forgiveness. And I was born again. He changed my life. Um, I, was, I was 12 years old at that time. 
And I came home, and my whole world had changed. But when I got home, the rest of the world hadn't changed. I still had a, a family that was very lost, uh, a family that was very broken. And the Lord sustained me through those times. I, I clung to Scripture closer in those years than perhaps I ever have in my entire life uh, because all I had was Christ. And so I went to a, a, a Bible conference at Crown College when I was um, about 14 years old. And I remember going there and thinking this would be like going to Christian camp all year round. And I had hoped the Lord would allow me to go there. So I began praying and saving money and working jobs and, and doing my best to try to, to work towards getting to Crown College. And a young man traveled through our church who was from Crown. And he said uh, he was planning on coming and studying here in the United Kingdom at Crown Hall. I don't think Crown Hall existed at the time. Uh, but he was coming to do the program here, and he was sharing with our church all the things that take place, starting Sunday schools and uh, preaching on the streets and knocking on doors. And I was a very backward child. I was very introverted and shy. And I remember telling the Lord, I want to go to Crown College, but please don't make me go to that country. And so um, long story short, uh, <laughs> in the middle of my time at Crown, God led me to study here for a term. And it, my experience here changed my life. Uh, I think in, in, uh, it was very easy and comfortable in Bible college in America. And it wasn't until I came here um, that God really tried my faith. He put me in, in positions that I couldn't do it on my own. And I had to truly rely upon him. And so that was really a turning point in my Christian life studying here. And so I remember uh, going from the young lad who prayed, God, please don't send me to England, to the one who's come back several times since then. And I found myself here this summer. I'm now a teacher in a Christian school. And so I'm on my summer holiday, and the Lord has graciously allowed me to serve here for the summer, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, but I, if I could share a verse with you, I think back on my life, and I think of the life of Joseph. Joseph went through a lot of difficult circumstances. His brothers despised him. They sold him into slavery. Uh, he was lied about, imprisoned. He was forgotten in prison. All these terrible things happen in Joseph's life. And at the end of the story, when he comes face to face with his brothers, I can only imagine the things I would have said to them. And in Genesis chapter 45, Joseph says this, Ye sold me hither, but God did send me before you to preserve life. And then in verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. He goes on um, later in chapter 50 to say, um, You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. As an ancient history teacher, we understand that Egypt was known as the breadbasket of the world, the world's supermarket. And had Joseph not been in the position to influence the Pharaoh to help during that time of famine, not only would Egypt have perished, but much of the known world at that time would have perished. And so God used all the difficult things in Joseph's life to save the world. And I think of my own life and all the, the horrible things that happened, especially when I was 11 and 12, year old, 12 years old. And I think now I'm teaching 11 and 12 year olds. And even though I'm teaching 11 and 12 year olds in a Christian school, I've come to learn even Christian 11 and 12 year olds have real problems. They go through real trials. And I look back on my life and think, God allowed those things to happen to me for this time. Because I'm allowed to pull these young people aside, put my arm around them and tell them, it doesn't seem like it's going to be okay right now. But God is working all things together for your good. And what an encouraging thing that God is always at work, even when we can't see it. And so I'm thankful to be here for this summer. I'm very sad to be leaving in, in just over five days. If I could stay, I would. And so I would ask it, that you would pray for me. I'm, I'm thankful for the position that I'm in right now, uh, but I'm certainly seeking the Lord's will for the future. And uh, if he would have for me to, to serve here um, long term in the future. So I'd really appreciate if you could help me pray about these things. And I'm grateful to be here with you today. 
Thank you, Nick. Please take time to pray for Nick. What a powerful testimony, isn't it? That the Lord used such a distressing situation that you'd never want any young person to go through, and yet God is getting the glory out of his life. And we praise, praise the Lord for that. Really pray for him. He's seeking the Lord's direction about what the Lord would have him to do in the, in the next little while. So please continue just to keep him uh, in, your, in your prayers. Nick, I remember he, he had the, our boys in, in uh, his tent at Camp Victory, and he texted me a couple years or a, a couple months later after having our, you know, our Liverpoolians there in his tent, and he said, he said, Pastor, he said, I think David was a scouser. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? And he texted me a, a verse out of Samuel where David says, I grabbed me this and I grabbed me that, and I went down and had me this and had me that. I said, I can definitely see how you'd understand. How do you think that? But very good. Let's pray for him. Um, but um, at this time, we'll, we'll make ready to just to, just before we, uh, we're not going to receive a tithe or offering. If you want to give at the end of the service, the offering bags are here at the front. So please feel free to do that uh, just after the service. Uh, but please do uh, uh, pray and, and give and give faithfully to the Lord's work. If you want to give towards missions or towards the building fund, we just ask you to please designate it. Put it there in the offering box and that will be wonderful. We're going to stand and sing here in just a moment just before the Bible message. But, but before we do... I'd like to just have a, a time of prayer. We haven't done this all the time. We, we do pray, but specifically I'd like for you to pray for camp. Uh, you've heard testimonies of several people whose lives have been greatly changed at camp, Nick, myself, and others. And let's really pray that God would work in a mighty way through the young people at camp this year. And so I'd like to ask Richard, if you wouldn't mind, to, let's just have a special time of prayer before camp begins this week. And so if you wouldn't mind to lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, that already tonight, Lord, that we've been blessed in our souls, Lord. We thank thee, Lord, that we've been encouraged, Lord, as we hear what thou art doing. We thank thee, Lord, that you do great and mighty things. And we think especially, Lord, the times in the Word, Lord, where you have been so happy in intense, Lord. We thank thee that your glory has come down yes. and fill those tents, Lord. We thank thee, Lord, that, Lord, that tabernacle was raised up and you spoke to the people. And we pray this week that in those tents and in the meetings Amen. that your presence would be there. Yes. We realize, Lord, this may be just uh, one chance in a lifetime for Amen. these youngsters, Lord, that they could come to know thee as Savior and Lord. Yes. We thank you for the workers, Lord. We pray especially that they will be, be given strength by thee. We think of the pastor with his throat and we know it's like to have a bad throat. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you'll just to put your healing hand upon him and upon his wife and upon all the workers, Lord. We pray especially for safety in the camp, Lord. Amen. We ask, Lord, that the camp will be protected. We ask for the journeys there and back. And most of all, Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight that we can have seen, Lord, wonderful things done from these camps in years past. Mm -hmm. And Lord, even in this five years, we've heard some wonderful things. So, Lord, what can we say tonight? Who can we turn to, Lord? For thou hast the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just pray for every need of that camp in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for the preachers, Lord. We ask, Lord, that they will have the right word for these children. We pray for the heart of the children to be melted. Amen. And we pray, Lord, for the workers too that there will be a desire to go deeper and deeper with thee. Yes. We pray for those neighbors around that area, Lord, that they will hear the singing and maybe yeah. inquire what's going on. Amen. We pray for all those things, Lord, and we want to just give thee all the glory and all the praise, Lord. Thank you for salvation in this place tonight, Lord. We know that thou art here. We know that thou art speaking already, and thou will speak, Lord. And we want to go away knowing that you've spoken to our hearts. Yes, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymn books. We'll stand and sing another hymn. Hymn number 254. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive thy church with life and power. O breath of life, come cleanse, renew us. And fit thy church to meet this hour. Let's pray and ask the Lord. Let's stand and sing and prayerfully sing this to the Lord. Ask him to, to revive that work once again. Let's stand and sing hymn number 254.
I've asked John Antalika to come along, and um, he was speaking at Norris Green today. We've gotten to know John over the last little while from camp. He's, he's a faithful member there at Oxford Baptist Chapel, and he's an itinerant preacher. The Lord's using him in a great way. He's been a great encouragement to my wife and I every time he comes and stays. And um, I thought with my voice being as gone as it is, um, perhaps it might be good to hear from somebody that doesn't sound like a broken um, uh, squeak box. And um, so please pray for John, and I know there will be a blessing to you. I told you today, he, he, sat, he asked me what I was preaching through on Sunday night. I told him the church in Revelation. He went back and listened. He said, well, he hadn't preached on Revelation 1, so I think I'll, I'll have a go with that this evening. I said, well, that'd be great. So please do pray for John. Have your Bibles ready as he brings the Word of God to us. Well, thank you. Oops. Well, I'm thankful to be here with you and um, thankful to Jared and his wife for their hospitality every time I come here in Liverpool. So please turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I've entitled this message, just in case uh, you're one of those who like to make notes, I've entitled this message, Behold the Glorious Head of the Church. Behold the Glorious Head of the Church. And uh, I would like to remind you before I begin that Whenever the Word of God is read and preached, it is God Himself speaking to His people. I'm simply the instrument. And so we want to be attentive to what God is saying to us this evening. So why don't we pray? You and I need the Lord's help. I need the Lord's help to be clear in the preaching of His Word. And you need the Lord's help to listen to what He has to say to you this evening. So let's pray very quickly. Our gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are thankful and grateful for the Word of God. We're thankful, Father, that we have in our hands a copy of God's Word and we can read it. Uh, Lord, it's not illegal for us to hold this in our hands, even though once in this country it was. And so I do pray that now you would rent the heavens and come down and, and may we as your people have a, a conscience that is captive to the Word of Truth so that we might be changed in the end. Anybody here, Lord, who is not saved, who has not yet put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I do ask that today will be the day of their salvation, that tonight will be the night uh, of their salvation, that tonight heavens will rejoice over one sinner who repents. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 1. I would like to read from verse 9. So if you have your Bible, Revelation chapter 1. I'll read from verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the, pa the papes with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool and, wild and white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the Alpha, and the Omega. I am the first and the last. We'll stop there. Near the end of the first century, there was a, an emperor named Domitian. 
And this emperor, at the end of the first, cent uh, first century, unleashed his fury upon the Christians. He persecuted them. And it was because of their unwillingness to accommodate or conform to Roman rule. And so as a result of that, they were severely persecuted. And history tells us that during this time, the Apostle John was arrested and he was sent on this island called Patmos, which is still there today uh, in the coast of modern Turkey, where the seven churches are, Ephesus, Smyrna, and so on and so forth. Now, at this point, the Apostle John was very old, he was frail, he has been carrying the burden of those churches in Asia Minor. Can you imagine that? Seven churches. He was the pastor of Ephesus once. And now, since the apostle Paul had died, had been martyred, and Peter likewise, now John, the last apostle, is carrying the burden of the church. A very heavy burden. But at this point, he, is, he has been sent, he has been arrested and sent on this island called Patmos. And he is by himself isolated and no doubt concerned about the state of the church. And so in, you have the context of persecution, and at the same time you have a spiritual decline taking place during that time as well. Sometimes when persecution comes, there are Christians, they would go on and follow the world, and that was happening during that time. But likewise, the idols of this world of the Roman world at the time were so strong that many of the believers there, many of the Christians, were just following the course of this world. Spiritual decline was a reality back there. And no doubt, no doubt, the Apostle John was concerned about the state of the church. No doubt he was concerned about the spiritual decline that was taking place in the Lord's church. The church for whom Christ died for, there he sees them on a spiritual decline. And he cannot do anything about it because he is isolated on this island called Patmos. And I wonder if John was perhaps questioning and asking, has Christ abandoned his church? Is he still ministering to his church today? Is Christ still in the midst of his church? In light of the spiritual decline, in light of the persecution that is taking place, Christians are being arrested, persecuted, and being killed. Even one of them was martyred, we read in chapter 2. Is Christ still in the midst of his people? I'll be honest with you, there are times where I ask the same question. The reason is because, not necessarily because of persecution that I see in this nation, because what we see today is not really persecution, even though there are Christians who are being ostracized and losing their jobs. But when you look at the spiritual decline in the church today, you wonder, has Christ abandoned his church? When you see the church allowing worldly philosophies and the vanity of this world inside, you wonder, is Christ still in the midst? When you see churches who are now confused somehow about marriage and confused somehow about gender, which the Bible is very clear about, you wonder, is Christ still in our midst? Why do we pray for revival? Because we see many churches dead. Many have bought into the confusion of the age. Let me put it this way. Christ is no longer the first love of many today. Your pastor just preached on that. And so against the backdrop of spiritual decline, against the backdrop of persecution, you ask yourself the question, is Jesus Christ still Lord over his church? You know, for a moment in this nation, it seemed as though the secular world was head over the church, dictating what the church should do or should not do. Is Christ still Lord over his church? And if you put yourself in the shoes of the Apostle John for a moment, this is very likely what he felt like. 
There he is on this island, isolated by himself, wondering, does Christ still care about his church? But you know, Christ really showed his love to the Apostle John by giving him this vision that we read in Revelation chapter 1. It was a vision of the glorious Christ, the head of the church. And it is my intention this evening to do the impossible task of painting a picture of what the Apostle John saw. You know, no mere man like me and you can paint a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But by God's grace, I try my best. So let's go through this vision that the Apostle John saw. And again, I've titled this, Behold the Glorious Head of the Church, Jesus Christ. That's what I desire for you this evening, that you come face to face with the glorious Christ. That's what the church needs today, to, become, to come face to face with their bridegroom, Christ Jesus. By beholding, we become. Whatever you behold, into that you shall become. If you're beholding an idol tonight, eventually you're going to turn into that idol. But if you're beholding the glory of Christ, you're going to be transformed into the image of Christ. And so this evening, my intention is for you to come face to face with the glorious head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And through this vision, I hope to do that. So firstly, we read in our text in Revelation chapter 1, the vision begins there in verse 9. I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. Now John is saying that he is also being persecuted. He was persecuted alongside these believers. And then in verse 10, we read this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That is a Sunday like our day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then we have the list of the seven churches. Now, so far, the Apostle John has heard what Christ has said. But now he's going to see. We read, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Now, you might think that's not significant. That is very significant and very encouraging for the Apostle John. Remember again the context, persecution and spiritual decline. And the thought is coming to John. Has Christ abandoned his church? And now all of a sudden, he sees this vision. And in this vision, seven golden candlesticks. Now, what are these? Verse 20 answers that question for you. The seven candlesticks are seven churches. The seven churches I read earlier, Ephesus, Smyrna, and so on. And John sees those seven churches, those seven candlesticks which represent those churches. And by the way, there is seven of them. Is that significant? Yes, it is. In prophetic literature, just like this book of Revelation, number seven is a number of completion. Completion. Complete. And so it's not just the seven churches that John is writing to, but all the churches in the ages to come, including Breck Road Baptist Church, including this church. So this vision was written for you. And it is Christ's desire that you see what John saw. And he sees seven candlesticks, which represent those seven churches. And very important, he sees one like unto the Son of Man. Christ in the midst of his church. Christ's presence in the midst of his church. He sees the presence of the one who was humiliated, of the one who lived a perfect life, of the one who died on the cross and eventually resurrected, ascended into the heaven and now glorified. He sees the presence of the head of the church amidst his church. 
Can I remind you that Christ in this, is in the midst this evening? That He is here tonight? He is in the midst. He has to. Do you know why? Because He is the head of the church. Christ is not a bridegroom who leaves His bride. He loves His bride so much, too much, to leave His bride. And He promised that. Isn't He the one who said, Lo, I am with you, well, until you deny me. Lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you as an orphan, the Lord Jesus Christ says. And so in this moment of, you might say, hopelessness uh, from, the, from the Apostle John, there he sees Christ in the midst of his church. That must have been so encouraging for John. And I hope it's encouraging for you. You know, there are times where perhaps you ask yourself, is Christ really in the midst? You know, all the troubles that happen in churches, you ask yourself, is Christ really in the midst? Let me encourage you and say this, He is in the midst of His people, always. Now that's encouraging. But you know, it's also scary, especially if you're not a Christian. You know, today churches are trying to accommodate to the world, make the church in such a way that it is pleasing to the world. And the reason is because we preach a false Christ, a one-sided view of Christ, many times. But let me remind you, if you're not a Christian here today, that the Lord Jesus Christ is in this place, His presence his holy presence is in this place. That's why we cannot tolerate sin in churches. And I would say this to you, if you're in your sin, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We just sang earlier, look to the Lamb, look to the Lamb. And so I would encourage you, gaze your attention on the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, to wash you from all your sins. There is still power in the blood of Jesus Christ today to wash you to wash your sins away. So come to him this evening. And so that's what John saw firstly in this vision. He sees the position of Christ. He is in his church. Secondly, John draws our attention to how he is clothed. Look with me in the next verse. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Let's stop there for a moment. So we've seen Christ's presence in his church. Now I want you to see Christ's priestly ministry in his church. How do I get that? Notice how he's clothed. He is clothed with a garment down to the foot. That is, Christ is wearing a robe. That was very common back there, back then. Very common. He's wearing a robe, and when you read the Old Testament, those who wore robes were the kings and the priest, especially the high priest. And in this text, we get a picture of Christ as the high priest, especially because of the next part of the verse. He is girt about, that is, Around his chest is a golden girdle, that is a golden belt. When you read Exodus chapter 28, God says to Moses, Make garments for Aaron the priest, because I have selected Aaron the priest to minister unto me. And you would read in chapter 28, we don't have time to go there, but you would read in chapter 28, that part of the garments that Aaron had to wear was a robe and many other things on top of it, but also a girdle, a golden belt. And it signified that Aaron is sanctified, that is set apart to minister to God's people. And there John sees Christ in the midst of his church, and he's wearing a priestly robe, a high priestly robe, signifying to you and me that Jesus Christ is still our high priest. And not just that, he's still actively 
actively doing what the high priest does. Isn't that encouraging? Now, what is the role of a high priest? The role of a high priest was to come in between God and his people and offer sacrifices on their behalf. But we know that Jesus Christ, the high priest, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, we read in, in the book of Hebrews, that he is the one that entered into the Holy of Holies and offered himself up on your behalf and my behalf. The only perfect sacrifice. He is the only high priest that actually sat down after having offered himself as a sacrifice. All of the high priests, they had to continually, continually, consistently offer sacrifices to God on behalf of God's people. But Jesus Christ offered himself and he sat down. Why? Because it was sufficient to save your soul and my soul. We read in the book of Hebrews, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. You can read the whole book of Hebrews. The word high priest is mentioned several times there. I would encourage you to do that. But that's what John sees. And is that what you see? When you come to church, not only is Christ in the midst here, not only that, but also he is performing his priestly, his high priestly role. That is, he's interceding on your behalf and my behalf. He sympathizes with your weaknesses, with your pain, with your hurt. Whatever you're going through, the Lord Jesus Christ sympathizes with you. And he comes in between you and God and he intercedes on your behalf. Would you fear if you knew that Christ was in there and interceding on your behalf? Would you fear? I don't think you would. I think it was Robert Murray McShane who said something like that. Would you fear if you knew that Christ was in the next room and interceding on your behalf? So when you come to church, when you come to, to this church, remember that you have a high priest who intercedes on your behalf and take comfort in that. And so that's what John sees. I'm sure that was encouraging for, for the Apostle John since he is not there amongst his churches. He's not there. But how wonderful it is for him to realize Oh, there is the glorious head of the church and he's wearing his high priestly robe and he is still ministering to his church. How wonderful is that? And how wonderful that is to even a minister, to a pastor. I'm sure sometimes pastors, they feel sometimes they feel like, like they're not doing a good job or whatever that may be. But isn't it wonderful to realize that there is the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ministering to his people even when they are not there? What a thought. What a thought. And so that's what John sees. The presence of Christ, the high priestly function of Christ in this church. And then we see something else. We see Christ's purifying work in his church. Look in the next verse. Verse 14. Now we turn to his features. We read, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. We have moved from his position, which is in the midst of the churches, to his priestly function, and now to his purifying work, in his church. Notice his head and his hair are as white as snow, as white as wool. Have you read that somewhere in the Bible? Though your sin is like what? Scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as white as wool. What is that signifying? Purity, holiness. And John sees the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is an attribute that we don't talk about much in the church today. But John sees the purity and the holiness of Jesus Christ. And not just that, he sees his eyes as flame of fire. 
That's both encouraging and scary. Both encouraging and scary. You see, you see why? It shows John that Christ is still after the purity of his church. He is gazing in his church. Even tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ has his gaze upon Breck Road Baptist Chapel and seeking to purify his people. He not only died for your justification, he died also for your sanctification. He died in also to conform you into the image of his Son. Romans 8.29 those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed into the image of his Son. Ephesians 5, many of you know this, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, in order that he might present the church to himself without spot or wrinkle or any such things. Christ desires a pure bride, and right there in this vision, John sees the pure, impeccable, holy Jesus Christ, and his eyes like a flame of fire. And it's very interesting when you read uh, in, in the, uh, the churches in chapter 2, John, or the Lord Jesus Christ, reminds the churches that his eyes are like flame of fire. Do you know why? Because he does want them to respond to his purifying work. You know, when the word of God is preached and you don't respond to it, does that show that you really care about your conformity to the image of Christ? Can I ask you this question? Do you care about what Christ cares about? Christ cares about your holiness, your sanctification, your, ho your, your purity. But do you care about what Christ died for? Let me say this to you. Christ did not die in vain. He did not die in vain. He died in order to have a pure bride, and He will have a pure bride. No matter what is happening in the world, no matter the persecution that, that John saw happening to the churches, no matter the spiritual decline, what a reminder for John that Christ is still after the purification of his church. And I'm encouraged by that, especially when you look, about, look at what's happening to the church of Jesus Christ today. I'm so thankful that there is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who still cares about the purity of his bride, of his church. But there is a warning in this. Notice his feet. He says in 15, his feet like unto fine brass as if they burn in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. You know, he sees what's in his church. That's why when you read chapter 2 and chapter 3, you constantly see this phrase, I know thy works. I know thy works and the tribulation. To Pergamos, I know thy works and where you stand, where you dwell. In Thyatira, I know thy works and charity and service and fruit. To Sardis, I know thy works. To Philadelphia, I know thy works. To Laodicea, I know thy works. To Bretwood Baptist Chapel, I know thy works. And here's the issue, my friends, if you don't respond to his purifying work, if you don't apply the word of God into your own heart, we read that he has feet like brass, like, as if it's been in a furnace, and his voice is like, the, is like the many waters, signifying to us that he is ready to discipline. He's ready to judge. And he's not going to bring eternal judgment upon his church because his church belongs to him. His church is in him. But he does discipline his church if his church does not respond to his purifying work. That's why he threatens some of the churches we read in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He says, if you don't turn, if you don't repent, then this will happen. And so, 
I would encourage you, when you hear the word of God, make it your intention to respond to the truth because it is meant to sanctify you. Isn't that what Christ prayed for? John chapter 17. Sanctify them in what? In thy truth. And where's the truth from? The word of God. And I'm sure John was so encouraged there to see the purifying work of Christ, to behold in this vision that Christ is still active in His church, not only interceding on, on behalf of the people in their weaknesses and in their suffering, but He's also sanctifying them with the truth. He's also purifying them. And one day, as we read in Revelation later on, the bride has made herself ready. What an encouragement that is. And you know that was Paul's concern? You remember that, Paul? I have betrothed you to one husband, Paul said. Paul's concern was the purity of the church of Jesus Christ. And that ought to be our concern as well as believers. Can I ask you this question? Do you care about the purity of your brother or your sister in Christ? Are you concerned about the sanctification of your brother or your sister in Christ? If you're married... Are you concerned about the purity of your spouse, their holiness? Because that's what Christ cares about, and that's what the apostles cared about. You should care about it too. And so we've seen the presence of Christ in his church. We've seen his priestly function in his church. We've seen his purifying work in his church. And finally, I want you to see the sovereignty and the protection of Christ in his church. Look in the next verse. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now, very quickly, the seven stars here, we read in, in verse 20, if you look with me, verse 20, it says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the word angels there in the Greek is the word angelos. And it can be also translated as messenger. This is not speaking about an angel with wings. It is simply speaking about the messengers in those churches. A pastor. An elder. And so we read that, back to uh, verse 16. And he had in his right hand the seven stars, which are the seven messengers. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Christ, John sees Christ holding in his right hand the seven messengers. Signifying to us, he holds in his right hand the leaders of the church. And that is an encouraging thing. That is encouraging if you're a leader in a church, if you're a messenger in the church, that he holds you in his right hand. And that is a place of comfort. I mean, if you're a false teacher, that's not a good thing. But if you're a faithful preacher of the word of God, to realize that even if your voice is going, even if you feel sick, you know that as a faithful servant of God's word, he is holding you in his hands. And you know, it says in the verse, um, verse 16, and he had in his right hand, that word had, the tense of that word is the present continuous tense, meaning he is continually, continually, consistently holding them in his hands. He is a sovereign one, and his messengers are simply the stewards, and he holds them in his hands to work in his churches. How encouraging it was for John. Because you know many of these leaders in those churches, in Revelation, some of them had been martyred, and some of them were perhaps uh, feeling discouraged. But John sees Christ holding these seven messengers in his hands. And again, number seven, the number of completion, signifying to us all the servants of Jesus Christ, all these messengers, Christ is holding in his hands hands but much more than that in the next verse we read this out of his mouth went two sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength 
You say, why, what, what is that about? What John sees is the Lord Jesus Christ who is ready to inflict judgment upon those who stand against his church. He holds his messengers in his hands and is ready to inflict judgment upon those who persecute his church. And if you are a minister during that time of the Apostle John, and you see the church being persecuted, how encouraging is that to know that Christ, He will bring justice. And there is a verse in the Old Testament in Zechariah where God says for the prophet, He says that the nation of Israel is like the apple of His eye. And so every time when you touch Israel, when you touch the nation of Israel, it's as if you are poking God in His eyes which is, by the way, the most sensitive part, right? And by the way, when someone is about to poke you in your eye, do you react? Yes. In the same way, when you inflict your hand upon the church of Jesus Christ, when you become a stumbling block, which some of the churches were being, some of the people in the churches were being like, God is ready, Christ is ready, to do something about it because he cares about his church he doesn't want his church to be deceived and that's a warning to false teachers that is a warning to those who would try to secularize the church a warning to those that would try to bring the world into the church beware beware what you do to the church of Jesus Christ beware what you do to God's people it's not because we are somehow privileged. We are privileged because we are in Christ. No, it's because Christ died for His church. And He cares about His church. He cares about you. He will protect you. He will guard you. And that's what John sees and I'm sure was very encouraged by. And I hope you're encouraged by that. And so as we end, I cannot do so without telling you how John responded to this. We read, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. As dead. Remember Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 6? When he saw the Lord, what happened? I am a man of unclean lips, dwelling among a people with unclean lips. Why, Isaiah? Why do you feel that way? For mine eyes have seen the Lord. And likewise, John sees the glorious head of the church and he fell at his feet as though dead. Ezekiel felt the same way. Daniel felt the same way. And you and I must feel the same way. A sense of fear and reverence when we come to the, in this place, when we come to church, knowing that Christ is in the midst. That word fear in the Greek is the word Phobe, where you get the word phobia for. We need a holy phobia of Christ. And if, if we truly have a, a knowledge of Christ, we will. A knowledge of Christ that comes from His Word. So believers, behold the glorious head of the church, Jesus Christ. He is in our midst, no matter what is happening in the world, no matter the persecution against the church in various parts of the world, no matter the spiritual decline that we see, be reminded that Christ is in the midst of His church. Secondly, Christ is actively interceding on your behalf and my behalf, even if we don't feel like it. Because at the end of the day, it's not about how you and I feel, it's about what His Word says. Thirdly, behold His purifying work in your life. Respond to that purifying work that He does for you. That's because He loves you. And that is because He desires a pure bride. And finally, recognize that Christ is sovereign over your life and He will protect you. And one day He will receive you in, your, in His kingdom. One day the bride will be made ready and there will be joy forevermore. No more fear, no more pain, no more tears, but bliss and joy. So I hope you're encouraged by what John saw. 
Let us pray. And let's thank God for his word. And let's thank God that he actually told John to write this vision for us so that we might behold him. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful and grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who humiliated himself by taking on the form of a servant, the form of a slave. And he came into this world as a baby. And he lived a life of obedience, perfect obedience unto death. We thank you that he took upon himself our sins and his body was scourged and his body was, was broken for us because of our sins. But we thank you that he was willing to be on that cross and take the full wrath of God upon himself for our sake. And so I do pray, O oh God, that you would please help us as your people to have our conscience captive to a full knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not only his death on the cross and, and his resurrection and his ascension, but also what he is doing for us now. Him who is our great high priest interceding on our behalf. Him who is in our midst even now as I am praying. Him who is still purifying his church and him who is still protecting his church. We thank you that we can be encouraged by this vision that John saw. May you encourage these believers in front of me for the sake of your name. Amen. Thank you, John. If you'll take your hymn books and turn with me, we'll stand and sing. Put my hymn book down. If you take your hymn books and stand and sing with me, we'll stand and sing hymn number 399. 399, we'll stand and sing as we close. Jesus, let me ever be firmly grounded upon thee, ever in thy work abide, ever in thy wounds reside. We'll stand and sing hymn number 399. <coughs>
let's remain standing. We'll be dismissed in, in prayer. And I was encouraged by that tonight. I hope you were as well. I think in the midst of difficult times, as he was painting the picture there, we're tempted to point at all of the wicked things that are going on in the world, aren't we? How bad the Roman government is, how bad the persecution is, and all of those things. But I'm interested in what Christ is interested in. He was not speaking to, in that time, to the Roman emperor. He wrote letters to the church. And he was concerned for the church. And think of this. I know thy works, the Lord said. The church is not the building, it's people. He knows the works of individual people. He knows what is going on in your life. And think of that. 1 Peter 4.17 says, Judgment must first begin at the house of God. Before you begin to complain about our nation and about our leadership, let God's word examine your own life and see that you're what you ought to be. If we're what we're ought to, we ought to be, then God will use us to be a light, a candlestick, a bright light in our community. But may we concern ourselves with what the Lord concerns himself with. Let's begin. Let's close in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank thee tonight for the privilege of being in thy house. We praise Thee, Lord, for the word that we have heard, the challenge it has been to our heart. We thank Thee that, Father, in the midst of difficulty, Thou art working. Even in the midst of real persecution that was going on in the church in Asia, Lord, we, we realize that, Lord, Thou art still working even today. Oh, how wonderful it is that we have a great high priest who is interceding for us, who has been tried and afflicted in every way such as we are, yet without sin. Oh, we are thankful, Lord, that, that the Lord Jesus knows and He is our great High Priest. That He commands us to cast our care and our burdens upon Him because He does care for us. Oh Lord, we pray tonight. Please help us, Lord, not to think of others tonight. Not to think about all the problems in the world. But may we seek to be right with Thee first and foremost. Oh Lord, we pray tonight that we would be right with Thee. That Lord, Thy Word would examine our heart and our mind. And that Thou will help us to repent and turn from sin that we might bring great glory and honor to Thee. That, Lord, we might be used as a bright light to win others to Thee. Oh, Lord, we pray that for the Breck Road Baptist Church, that, Lord, we would be a bright light in our city. We pray that many would come through these doors and hear the words of the gospel and be saved. We pray, Lord, that Thou wilt never extinguish our light, but that, Father, it would grow and increase, and we could be used to help light other lights throughout this country. Lights in the lives of young children and families and homes all throughout our city. Oh Lord, please, we pray, help us to heed thy word tonight. Oh Lord, we pray, help us to remember that thou dost know our works. So please be with us now as we go our separate ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.